Okay, uh, hi, thanks for being here. Uh, welcome to my talk, Getting Out of Quicksand uh, with DevOps. So uh, how did I end up here? So my name is Roland Pickle, we already heard that. Um, for the last half year and a half, I've been a technical project manager at uh, Electrobit, which uh, is an automotive software company. Uh, before that, I've been the CTO of a medium-sized company in uh, Vienna. Uh, I'm also from Vienna. And I have a background in IT and business, which means that uh, I've studied business administration, so I'm a bean counter. Um, um, I majored in, in production management and innovation management, but I also have a master in uh, computer science. Uh, so the uh, DevOps and CI, CD is really the sweet spot for me because everything I learned in my production management courses and in um, my supply chain management courses now not only fit in my head, but also in the industry now. Uh, things from the Toyota production system, for example, are applied in the software industry. Okay. Um, what I also wanted to say is that I'm here to learn, so I'm looking forward to the discussion, especially if your opinions differ from mine. I have some very strong opinions, but uh, I only uh, hold them very loosely. <laughs> and with this, we can get, get going. Uh, in September last year, uh, I was speaking at DevOps uh, days in Cairo, and Andrew Sheffer showed, uh, he, he, he made the keynote and he showed this slide and this quote and it's saying I don't have time to learn new things because I'm too busy getting things done and he's quoting the least uh, productive person in the world during that time I was also working at uh, this talk and the, this quote really resonated with me because I at this uh, point in time I was reading uh, Tom DeMarco's book Slack it's quite an old book already uh, but it also states that we are all too busy, and this not uh, is not only it not only kills our efficiency, but also our effectiveness. So uh, being effective is about doing the right things, while being efficient is about doing the things in the right manner. You are efficient when you do something with minimum waste. You are effective when you are doing the right something. So you can be one without the other, you can be both or you can be neither. Uh, an example that helped me understanding the difference, uh, imagine you're driving your car and your car breaks down. And um, it turns out you have a flat tire. But maybe you don't know that yet, so you start, I don't know, cleaning the engine or cleaning your car. And you could be very efficient at this task, but it's still the wrong task. So you're very efficient, but you're not effective. At the same time, if you, um, you get all your tools, you start changing the right tire, and so you're doing the right thing, but it still takes you two hours or something because you haven't done it before, you are effective, but you're not efficient. Um, so we can be both, we can be either of them, uh, and we can also be neither. Um, but what is important is that we find the right balance between this. In uh, Tom DeMarco's book, he cites the evolutionary biologist uh, Ronald Fisher, and it's uh, quoted as the Fisher's fundamental theorem, and he says that the more highly adapted, which is efficient, an organism becomes, the less adaptable it is to any new change. So, uh, in my career, I found myself in a situation very similar to the following multiple times. So I'm part of a, of a dev or s a service team, Let's assume I'm this uh, guy, and I'm working like 100% of my usual work time. So I'm not doing a lot of overtime. Uh, what we also see is that uh, we have maybe a more um, experienced person like this one with his hair or her high hair on fire because uh, she or he are working overtime, um, being the bottleneck, working on weekends, having the most experience, uh, skipping lunch or having it at their desk. And maybe we have a more junior person uh, only working 90% of their work or of their uh, usual hours or having some spare capacity. But the issue is that uh, uh, the two of us don't really have time to uh, show the, the less experienced person how to do stuff. 
and maybe we also uh, we really like updating our Windows servers manually, <laughs> so we are keeping on uh, these dear tasks. And, and what we experience are systems of overload. So we have decreased team morale, we work long hours, we work when sick, more frequent illnesses and unhealthy task queues. And the interesting thing is the following discussions get more and more frequent. So I've changed the pictures here. So we use different uh, cat pics in our Slack, but other than that, it's more or less a screenshot. So uh, one of my colleagues tells me that we really need to fix the X, Y, Z hell. And me as being the team lead or the technical project manager, I ask them, how long does it take? And then I expect something like a week or a month or a year. But something very interesting happens. My colleague tells me that the estimate for doing something like this is around two to three days. And I'm like, what? What are we talking about? Th it's a no-brainer. If it's really that important, we should do it. But it never happens. And it hurts again and again. We really need to uh, fix the deployment pipeline, use a static code analyzer, I don't know, introduce a better debugger, update our servers. And um, I feel like this. <laughs> no thanks, I'm too busy. Uh, I know that there are better ways of doing stuff. I've talked to my colleagues uh, who have way more experience than I. I've been to conferences like DevOps Unicorns here in Riga. And we are just too busy. So who of you can relate to that? Do you have any of these not having time to improve stuff? Okay, some of you. <laughs> okay, so I go to my manager and ask him or her for support in DevOps, in testing. Uh, and he says, yeah, you know, I don't know if you really look, should look for someone in this area. Maybe you could, could just do some redistribution of work um, and it will certainly take time to find someone. And I'm not even sure if we were able to, if we were able to utilize this person up to 100%. But um, the manager has a bad idea. He will talk to another manager and this manager in his team has a colleague, he's working on five projects, but one of them was just canceled or is on hold. And uh, you know, this guy or this uh, woman, he has like the 20% or the, the, like the missing capacity that you need. And I'm like, uh, no, that's n never going to work. Uh, and because the issue is that I cannot easily do the task of my colleagues. So um, our individual knowledge workers are not freely uh, exchangeable. I'm not a resource. And you don't want to utilize your people 100% anyway, because utilization is not a good proxy for productivity. And the manager's like, what? What are you actually talking about? And I say, let's talk about queuing theory. So when I was preparing for this talk, I remembered my uh, operations research classes and I noticed uh, when I looked into this in detail again that it's at least for me, it's quite complex to understand. But uh, let's look at the simplest uh, at the simplest queue. So if you have a G G one queue, which means that uh, you have a single server and the inter-arrival times have a general, meaning arbitrary distribution, and the service time have a different general distribution. You could imagine uh, going to a supermarket and you go, there's like one cashier and you take your basket and uh, the arrival time between customers have a has a different distribution and due to the fact that uh, people buy different things, the service time also has a different distribution. So the lead time, which is the time to go through the whole process of a system is heavily influenced by the service time, the utilization of the actor and the, the variation in the process, which is uh, the variation in task and the variation in the inter-arrival times. This is also what the, the king equ equation tells us. Um, uh, it says that yeah, you have two terms. You have the service uh, time, you have the, um, the your two variabilities, uh, and uh, your, cap your capacity utilization. So it, um, it sounds quite difficult, but it, uh, it, it just means that, for example, if you're 50% busy, then you're 50% idle, so 1 minus 50% so 
five. So this would be one in this case. And you have a, s a service time, for example, one unit of time, and then multiplied by this uh, variability term. Um, if you assume that software development and operations uh, is a process, is also a process of high variability with a decent amount of task variability, and I think that's the case, then uh, this applies. Then the wait time is related to the percentage of time busy by the percentage of time idle. Uh, so the thing is, if you're 50% idle, you're 50% uh, you busy, you're 50% idle, uh, which means that, yeah, as I said before, this would be one. It will be multiplied by one unit of time and the variability. The, but the problem is that if you're 90% busy, um, then this would be nine times higher. Like you have 90% divided by 100 minus 90 is like, uh, yeah, nine multiplied by this uh, time. So it's nine times, your waiting time would be nine times longer. And what you also see at this graph, uh, I uh, charted busy uh, divided by idle for different uh, numbers, that this highly deteriorates at 70 or 80%. So it's also already getting bad here but uh, it's, it's get really getting worse if the if it there is the the um, the service worker is uh, uh, utilized a lot. Okay, so there's uh, an inherent conflict between service quality and capacity management, and things deteriorate heavily at 70, 80 percent. And there's also a, a similar idea. It's called Little's law, which uh, shows a relationship between the average lead time, the average working progress, and uh, the average throughput, but we will come back to that. The important takeaway is uh, that you really should focus on throughput rather than utilization. And if you reach high utilization levels, all your work is just piling up and everyone gets very nervous and will call for status meetings and more planning, and this adds work and it escalates quickly. And then you reach a state uh, that one of my colleagues in Vienna uh, in a GitOps presentation referred to as quicksand. So the more you fight it, the more it pulls you in. Each time you try to put your leg out, it sucks you in again. But don't panic. So I really like this metaphor, and I was curious how to get out of real quicksand. So and I googled this, and. Uh, I like to apply this metaphor also to the solution of getting out of quicksand. So what Google is saying, don't rely on this, uh, just Google it, but uh, still. So they are saying, make yourself as light as possible. Toss your bag, jackets and shoes. So for me that could mean reduce your work in progress. Then try to take a few steps backwards, for example to analyze the situation, uh, keep your arms up and out of the quicksand, so make sure that you're still able to act. Uh, try to reach for a branch or a person's hand to pull yourself out, but make sure you don't pull them in. Take deep breaths, uh, move slowly and deliberately. So with all these insights and uh, after studying my, uh, my university course uh, material again, I go to my manager and tell him, you know, what we really need is more people, and all of them should only be utilized up to 80%, so that they can invest roughly a day per week, like 20%, to spur innovation, rethink, practice new ways, master new skills, and improve our workflow. Because that's how it's done, for example, at or has been done at 3M, they had like this 15% time, and Google also had this 20% time, and uh, what I also really loved is in the at, at Google they have this site reliability engineer role and their principle number two says that uh, people must have time to make tomorrow better than today. And I think that's something every one of us should think about. So you do, ha do you have the time and capacity to make tomorrow better than today? So after all this research and listing all the pros and maybe the cons, I've persuaded my manager, but it's too late. What actually happened is that we got even more to do and we spent considerable time interviewing. It, it was also quite unsure whether we would actually find someone. 
So the colleague, you know, the one with the hair on fire, he couldn't just bear it anymore and just quit. Now me and the other team member, we also have our hairs on fire. We are under heavy pressure. And the issue is that people under time pressure don't think faster. Uh, but at least we found, in uh, after a long search, a very skilled professional who starts today. Could be you. And given that you have just joined the team, you usually cannot jump right in. So you have some slack, at least in the beginning. So congratulations, you just joined a team in an existential crisis. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, in the A Seat at the Table book, Mark Schwartz writes that transformational projects occur when the amount of debt has become too much to bear. So often organizations and also teams sometimes need a crisis before they really take continuous improvement seriously. And I think the reason for that is that now a 10% change is not good enough anymore. It doesn't help or it's not enough to work overtime, for example. Now you really need like a 50% improvement. Some of the time or most of the times an engineering solution. So if you can establish a sense of urgency, so we have really have to change how we work, um, a safe environment for failure, things that were already late will shift, but we really need to try something else and have the courage to question the status quo, which might be easier if you're new, uh, crisis or chances. One example, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I think it fits. So, um, when, when back three years ago, when I was the CTO uh, of this medium-sized company, we were doing uh, Android and iOS apps in a very specific domain, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and one of our service members quit, so I had to support the, the, the ops team, or the service team, we called it back then. And I asked them, how do we deploy our iOS apps? So they told me, and we had like an app for different cities, so one app had like five different variants for five different cities. So for each of the five apps, do the following. Check out the code on your local PC. Make sure you have the right Xcode version installed. Uh, do the three manual changes select the right signing certificate, whatever it is, compile, upload to App Store, enter, update all the relevant uh, metadata, and then wait for Apple to review the software. So this whole process without the review from Apple uh, took approximately one day. But then I asked him, but what if uh, the developers or the testers or the customers which have a bit beta version, they find an error? Uh, yeah, and they told me, we have to start over again. And this is so painful that we release very seldom and we ask the team for less releases, which are better tested. And I said, sorry, I won't do it that way. Uh, it, was, uh, it is 2015, at least back then, and there has to be a better way of doing this. Maybe what was a good solution in the past is not the best solution uh, today anymore. And being fortunate, uh, one year earlier, in 2014, uh, Fastlane was released. Is anyone using Fastlane? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Fastlane, uh, it's among other thing, things, it's doing a lot of stuff, but among other things, it helps you to recreate a uh, delivery pipeline uh, for your Android and iOS apps. Uh, and it, it was released 2014. So, um, we used a very early version, so I set up Fastlane with Jenkins in a way that by clicking a button, so sometimes it still needs a button, um, and waiting 20 minutes, uh, everything was done. And the cool thing about the button is um, that anyone could do it. So we heard before you maybe don't need buttons button anymore. I think it's still, sometimes it needs a button. So it, like the project manager can click a button. Um, this took us roughly a week. Uh, to get the first version up and running, and ever since uh, releasing iOS and also Android apps was a non-event, and we did it more frequently, and as I said before, with the push of a button. So, it really takes someone like you who questions the status quo, maybe someone who uh, is new in the team, but where to start? Um, I think first you could or you should quantify the work. So what I like to do is something called uh, activity accounting. So you allocate um, the cost of your activities in the team 
uh, two different uh, categories to uncover non-value work. So for example, you can do this on your timesheets or look at your task board. Uh, what I also think is you should not only watch out for these categories, uh, but all the things that you don't do or do very infrequ infrequently. For example, any updates, re releases, retrospectives, and so far and so forth. Uh, what you could also see if you look at your um, timesheets are people multitasking, which could uh, mean that people are waiting for feedback, uh, for example, due to long build times or other people not being available. Um, as a side note, what I also like to do, and it was really helped us when we were in this uh, head on fire situation, is visualizing our work. So in my last company, we put up a very big monitor, like an information radiator, uh, showing our Kanban board, and everyone could see what we were currently working on. And if they had uh, differing priorities or thought we should work on something else, then of on the Kanban board, they saw to whom they would have to talk to uh, to get their uh, the task shifted uh, in the front. This also reduced the number of interruptions uh, and also helped to show that we had a lot of things to do. And yeah. So uh, this is taken from the Accelerate State of DevOps report 2018. They are doing this benchmark. And what they find is um, in the elite group, uh, people working 50% of their time uh, doing new work, like new features, for example, and only 10% working on defects and 5% on customer support work. On the other uh, end of the line, you have a low group. They are only have 30% of the time working on new work, 20% on unplanned work and rework, remediating security issues, 10%, and then working on defects and customer support work uh, amounts to 35% of their work, which means uh, it could be that they at least either have a quality problem or a documentation problem. So you could benchmark yourself, for example, against these numbers. So now you know what you're spending your time on and you should maybe s set some goals based on these benchmarks. But what takes so long? Uh, there is a saying that says what gets measured gets managed. So I think you should measure flow time, for example, lead time and cycle time, depending on the product or your project that may be very uh, close to each other. Uh, you could also measure the frequency of deployment, the mean time to restore services, the work in progress, and find the biggest bottleneck and think about whether we could fix this, uh, whether you could fix this bottleneck and bring the pain forward. Um, I think you should also ask why five times to find uh, uh, root causes and uh, sometimes fixes are quite easy once you know the problem. Uh, one example, I once worked in a project where the full cycle of building and testing took 26 hours. And I was uh, responsible for doing the release process back then. It was a, a manual process. And it took me one hour of my time. I had to copy some files from here to there, and I really hated it. But uh, I thought that if our build cycle takes 26 hours and releasing manually takes one hour, I still should fix the build cycle first. Like this is the, the, the bottleneck. Even if that means that I would have to do the manual process more often in the beginning. I reckon may maybe at least I get a very good understanding of this manual process and automate it in another step. So I had a look at the build time. Uh, I opened Jenkins, uh, had a look at, this, uh, at the console log, very long console log, uh, and being new to the project, I didn't, re I didn't really understand what's happening, but uh, I, I thought at least I could find out what is taking so long. So the first thing, uh, that I found out is that not all the entries in the console log had timestamps. So Jenkins has a plugin for everything, so I installed the timestamp plugin and then I had uh, uh, timestamps on every entry. What I found in another step is that our build was disk bound, so we had an I.O. problem. Um, <laughs> being fortunate again, there was a very small SSD in this build PC, so it really is like a desktop PC back then. Um, and 
I used this SSD to run an experiment. So uh, I shifted one of these uh, build jobs to the SSD, and what I saw is a 36% improvement. So the whole build was 36% uh, percent faster. So I went to my manager and told him that these are the cheapest 300 euro you can invest to get like this big uh, investment, uh, big uh, speed up. And uh, we did it. But you don't have to stop there. Uh, I recently read a book uh, from uh, Mick Kirsten. It's called uh, From Project to Product. And what I like about this is not only measuring um, flow, like flow velocity, efficiency, distribution, time, and load, but he also correlates that to the business to business uh, metrics like value, the cost, the quality, and what I like best about the happiness of the team working on this project. Um, yeah, what I wanted to show is, does this work? Oh, sorry, I have to. So I, I just said I've, I just recently uh, read this book, uh, but I also I created this dashboard where I see the, the flow time and the, the flow load of our current process. I use, uh, created this using uh, smashing, and I can click on these and uh, see all the gyro issues, for example, that were uh, fixed uh, or that were uh, fixed in recent releases last year, but have not or uh, and measure the flow time for each of them. So in this uh, setup, we have uh, ha I work in an embedded environment with a desktop configurator. In this uh, case, we have like an 81 days flow time. So this is quite uh, something we should improve on. What I also measure is the build time of all our jobs, uh, the tickets open, the tickets in review, tickets that we did but which are not yet released. Uh, you also see that we have a lot of uh, working progress just sitting there waiting to be released. Also open pull requests, the open support requests, and, and so far and so forth. And these are live numbers. So we have a dashboard in our uh, hallway where everyone sees these numbers and we started some discussions based on this. Uh, op. Okay, so uh, when you are in an overload situation, there's the tendency to do more planning. But I think rather you should accept that uh, the uncertainty uh, of software development and appreciate uh, its flexibility. There is a decreasing marginal utility of each hour spent planning. Uh, some authors even say that every hour spent planning is an hour not delivering because the uh, resources overlap. For example, your most senior developer or architect are doing uh, the planning tasks. So uh, instead, uh, offers of several books says you should come up with a lightweight uh, capacity planning, a just-in-time approach, and prioritize by cost of delay. For example, what they're doing in uh, the book from Gary Groover, uh, he's the guy behind the uh, HP firmware, laser chip firmware, uh, the new laser chip firmware initiative. And what they did is they just listed all the initiatives. Uh, rank them. There's only one most important initiative that's very important, and then uh, there's more or less just a cutoff where they say, okay, we can work on these, but we cannot work on the others. Uh, and if you want to change that, um, you can change the order, but we are not doing a very detailed planning anymore because it doesn't really help anymore. Uh, so less is more. And this is also something that you should take into account uh, when looking at your work items. So. Uh, when looking at, uh, at Little's Law, it says that we should reduce working progress, we should reduce batch size. Uh, from, the, um, from the Kingman's equation, it also says we should reduce variability and increase predictability. Uh, of course, it depends on your project. If you are innovating and experimenting, of course, you don't want to increase predictability. That's the reason why you're doing an innovative product, right? You want to find out new things. Uh, also do less. Uh, there are studies uh, saying that 50%, uh, up to two-thirds of all um, features do not deliver uh, the business intent or improve any key metric. Um, I also think you should 
uh, invest in a self-service platform. As I said before, if you do a lot of automation, you reach the point where it doesn't really matter anymore who clicks the button, at least for the uh, happy path. So um, it changes from a matter of uh, skills and permission, or a matter of skills and having time, to a matter of having the right positions to being allowed to clicking this button. Um, and I, what I also wanted to state is that you should eliminate it before you try to automate. So in a lot of talks at DevOps conferences, and I'm at a lot of conferences, they some speakers tell us to automate all the things. But I think that's not true. We should not automate all the things. The first, uh, the biggest uh, impact you have, or the, the first thing you should uh, strive for is eliminate. So not doing, or reducing, or uh, removing toil. So you should make time to create automation. Also documenting the, the process and making it repeatable is the first step. But then automate, eliminate, or engineer out the drivers that are not key to your value proposition. So for new work, that's very hard to automate. That's the creative stuff. That's what you're doing. Uh, but the repetitive work, that's stuff that a computer could do. It's also important to fix the biggest bottleneck first. And how could you do that? There are different uh, frameworks to, to do that. Uh, one that I like is the leftover principle, which means uh, we eliminate uh, or automate everything uh, we can, and the rest is done by humans. Uh, of course, this has some shortcomings as well. But first start to eliminate, then the easy and rare stuff you can, you have to do, or you should do manually. The easy and frequent stuff you should automate. For the frequent uh, difficult uh, stuff, you could acquire a solution or find an open source project that does that. For the rare and difficult stuff, uh, you should create tools document, and then the very rare, very difficult stuff, you maybe sh should hire a consultant or uh, someone who, who did this before. Um, so automation is not a silver bullet solution. It's nice, but a word of caution is necessary. Because the issue is that when the new automation is in place, there is less total work to be done by humans, but what is left is harder. This is also depicted in uh, this J-curve. It's, again, uh, from the Accelerate State of DevOps Report 2018. And what they say is the team begins the transformation, and I they identify quick wins. They automate to uh, reach this medium performer level. But then they find out that the whole process doesn't really scale. So for example, all the manual testing, they cannot do it manually anymore. So they have to invest uh, heavily and uh, improve their process and automate their uh, testing to reach this state of excellence where uh, relentless improvement is necessary. So you need relentless improvement to reach the state. Um, so for example, if you use Fastlane or the, the magic things we just saw in the, in the previous presentation and something does not work as expected, then uh, at least for me, it takes a day to really understand what's going on. So we have a lot of tools, they're very powerful, but they're abstracting away the difficult stuff. And if it breaks, if Docker breaks, for example, uh, have fun figuring out why. So uh, we freed ourselves from quicksand, which as described is a vicious circle. It pulls you in the harder you try to resist. If you're not constantly working to improve, then by default, you're getting worse. It's like the second law of uh, thermodynamics where entropy just increases. But what's next? What we actually want to establish is a virtuous circle. Uh, so a recurring cycle of events, the result of each one being to increase the beneficial effect of the next. So exactly the opposite of the uh, vicious circle. Um, and this is also what they discuss in the Accelerate book. And uh, also Chess Humble, in uh, the one of the authors of Continuous Delivery, says that you have to invest in removing waste so that you increase throughput. Prioritize improvement that will do the most to improve flow. Start with the bottleneck, biggest source of waste first, and then fix it, then identify the bottleneck, uh, the next bottleneck. 
And that's what they're saying in the salary book. Improving your software delivery effectiveness will improve your ability to work in small batches and incorporate customer feedback along the way. Lean product management practices positively impact software delivery performance, stimulate a generative culture, and decrease burnout. And then now the interesting part, software delivery performance drives lean product management. So it's like a circle. It becomes a virtuous circle. Um, there are different approaches to that. One experimental approach, and I think ex experiments are very important. It's like the third way of DevOps learning is very important. Uh, the improvement cutter, you set out the direction. You don't really know how to go there, but you grasp the current condition. Uh, you establish your next target condition, and then you conduct experiments to go there. But then you start again. Uh, another tool which can help uh, is to collect improvement ideas and prioritize them. And uh, I think what's very important, it may be obvious, but I still see this in some companies that they focus on the hard, high impact change. So for example, they're saying, we're not going to change anything in our current build environment anymore because we're going to replace it next year anyway. So it doesn't uh, really pay off. But that's not true. Actually, you should do the high impact, easy things first because the, your build environment, if you have a bad build environment, it hurts you every day and it pays off very quickly. So, as I said before, a lot of companies are waiting for this grant rewrite, which never happens because it's hard. <laughs> um, so again, we want to have a virtual circle. We want to uh, have more releases and test automation and improvements, faster releases, more time for new work, more frequent releases, smaller batches, which lead to fewer changes per release, lower lead time, which lead to fewer bugs per release, faster feedback, it's all about faster feedback, higher confidence in your build, lower variability and rework. So you have more time to automate, uh, you have lower utilization, you have decreased burnout and higher job satisfaction and off it goes, it's like a circle. So speed up the feedback loop, reduce waiting time, get results faster. So taking this into account, we went uh, on a journey of roughly six months to one year uh, we really spent 20% or roughly one day uh, a week to improve something. This may not have been, uh, we may not have fixed the bottleneck in each and every case, but at least it made the bottleneck more obvious. Uh, we created a self-service pipeline. We reduced stress uh, and our own workload. We also used uh, information radiators to inform others about our current work, uh, which reduced interruptions, and we set uh, clear priorities and weekly goals. So rather, in this case, rather than hiring more people, uh, cha changing this crisis as an opportunity for change uh, really allowed us to transform our way of working, reaching a state where we did way more with way less, being more effective, efficient, and happy and satisfied at the same time. So uh, I want to conclude with a recap of things that we talked about today. So this is my experience, uh, and this is a complex or at least complicated problem, and your mileage most likely uh, vary. Um, crisis situations are opportunities for change. Uh, Churchill once says, said that uh, never waste a good crisis. Uh, it also often takes fresh eyes and the courage to see uh, problems, so see the elephant in the room. Um, get out of quicksand. I think the sky is the limit. And yeah, I think you should quantify the work and set goals, measure, less is more, automate the right things, establish a continuous improvement process, and start a virtuous circle. This is also in line with the three ways of DevOps, like the first way is working on your workflow, the second way is improving feedback, and the third way is uh, continual experimentation and learning. And don't forget that it's uh, people over process over tools, so it might not be a technical problem, just uh, find the right people. Uh, if you want to know more, you should, you could, read these books. All these authors also have very interesting uh, YouTube uh, uh, channels or talks. You could also talk to me afterwards. And I want to close with a quote uh, from Dominica de Grandis book. It's called uh, Making Work Visible. And they say that we don't let our servers get to 100% capacity utilization. So let's not do that to ourselves. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for your attention. Get in touch. Well, thank you, Roman. Uh, 
Time for questions. Time for the questions. And we got one uh, that has uh, got a global outreach, 19 likes. Uh, that well, looks uh, like a very interesting one then. Uh, as a manager, do you allow working remotely on what grounds and rules and conditions you let it happen? Tell us about it, please. Oh, that's very nice. Like from, uh, in the company that I work for, I have a very nice contract. Uh, I have a contract that does not bound me to any time or space. So, uh, and also uh, my, my team, uh, like half of my team is sitting in Romania, half of it is sitting in Zagreb, and some people are sitting in Poland. So once you have one person remote, everyone is remote. So actually I, I'm also working a little bit on the side from this conference, so yeah, I allow it and I like it. I still think if you have remote workers, it, it's very important that uh, you meet once or twice a year, everyone gather, see each other, face-to-face -face contact is very important. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. I think uh, it was answered right. No? Okay, there's another one, a very serious one. Do you like pickles? <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, we, uh, I have a running group with my, with my family. We were running uh, relay marathons and we are called Mixed Pickles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we know, now we know he does like pickles. Okay, there's, uh, there's uh, one more we can ask you, one more. How to patch KDE for a free BSE? I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Nobody knows. So let's, uh, let's uh, get to the next one, who, which uh, has uh, the same exact likes, six. Have you ever left we, I, am? So it will appear in a minute. <laughs> Have you ever left we, uh, with? <laughs> That's easy. It's, it's escape. Uh Colon, coup, and then exclamation mark, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I think there's uh, there's a room for one more, and uh, let's uh, let's uh, say that's the last one. Any tips for maintaining efficiency in a team that are already working in a burnout situation? That's a tough one. Okay. Well, I think that the question is. What's more important, efficiency or effectiveness? Like, are you doing the right thing, or uh, is it about doing it with minimum waste? I think something that does, I can talk about things that don't work. It, what doesn't work, at least for me, is working harder. So <laughs> I think it's really important to take a step back and, uh, and analyze the situation and also shift some work. So uh, as I said before in this, uh, in this situation where one of our colleagues quit, we intentionally, well, it doesn't sound too nice, we didn't put blame on him, but for some project we said, okay, that's late, this uh, colleague left, we cannot do it now, so we shifted it, maybe we shifted it more than it would have been necessary just to improve our process and get it done. Well, okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please make thank some you. noise, Roman. <laughs> <laughs>